Hello, everyone, and welcome to our discussion this morning on the evolution of Dr. Kolkaba's theory of holistic comfort. My name is Dr. April Bice, and I will be the presenter today. And I'd like to start out this conversation and discussion with you, just letting you know that I'm currently in a place where I've got a lot of little comfort mechanisms going on for me. I'm in one of my favorite rooms. I've got my nice warm cup of coffee. Got some flowers next to me. The temperature setting is great in here and I'm feeling good. Before I started this presentation, I thought to myself, I closed my eyes and I said, this is gonna go really well. And I can't wait to spend some time with these people who want to learn about Kolkata and comfort theory. So I would encourage you right now during our presentation to take advantage of whatever comfort mechanisms you can so that you can spend this time um, listening and engaging um, with the presentation as comfortable as possible. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about comfort context and of course the tenets of the theory and um, we'll get going right away. I'm gonna share my screen first. All right, so we will be discussing today the evolution of a relevant nursing concept, Kokaba's theory of holistic comfort. Again, my name is Dr. April Weiss, and I am a PhD prepared uh, certified pediatric nurse practitioner. And I am also an assistant professor at the University of North Carolina in Wilmington. And my co-presenter, of course, the expert, the um, pioneer herself, Dr. Catherine Kolkaba, was not able to join me today, unfortunately, but she certainly contributed significantly to the presentation and she brings her warmest um, welcome and wishes as well. So today, what I would like to discuss with you uh, is really a focus on analyzing the pertinent elements, concepts, propositions, and then a working framework of Kolkaba's comfort theory. All right, and next we're going to discuss some past and present innovations, as well as applications of Kolkaba's comfort theory, because there is a little bit of a difference when it comes to innovation and application of the theory, but they're both pertinent to the evolution of the concept and the evolution of her theory. And then we're going to examine some ways to implement use of Kolkaba's comfort theory. And I think that'll be a really important part of this discussion because if you have an interest in comfort theory, then you likely have an interest in the application of enhancing comfort in patients and students at your workplace, your institution, et cetera. So I believe that will be really um, engaging and wonderful for you guys as well. All right, so why comfort in nursing? The very basic answer to the, this question is that comfort is germane to the discipline of nursing. When have you ever met a patient uh, or even a person that did not have comfort needs? They just don't exist. Everybody has comfort needs. Everybody wishes to be comfort. We all have areas in our life and in our being of wanting to enhance comfort. That is normal part of um, being a human. So comfort and nursing go hand in hand. And that's essentially why they make such a great pair. The other thing that's important, and it really is the focus of our discussion today is that comfort never escapes evolution. And what I mean by that is we could evolve another 100 to 200 years, guys, and people would still have comfort needs, right? Everyone has needs for comfort. And so comfort never escapes evolution and it is always an evolutionary concept. It will always be a part of nursing. It will always be a part of the care that we provide to our patients and provide to people, families, no matter what age across the lifespan. So I wanted to preface our discussion today by um, talking, speaking to you about a quote that I wrote in the most recent um, uh, edition of Martha Allgood's 10th edition of Nursing Theorists and Her Works. It's in press currently, so I'm referencing that here um, for the, um, the book, but it's really essential for us to think about comfort theory in terms of the current state of the world. So I wanted to preface this discussion with um, this quote. In the unforeseen and unforgettable time of a coronavirus pandemic, nurses have provided comforts in ways they never thought they would. The World Health Organization declared 2020 as the year of the nurse, and that's exactly what it became. Across the globe, nurses have engaged in substituting for family members and friends. 
They provided comfort in various ways, even in times of death, when husbands, wives, mothers, fathers, sons, and daughters could not hold their loved ones due to quarantine. This substitution comfort was coupled with the growing need for nurses to also be comforted and transcend into a modern world, going through an age-old threat, a novel virus. So the point of uh, us going over this current slide is really to understand the tremendous impact that COVID has had on the comfort of not only our patients and families and institutions, but also nurses. Nurses are an extreme need. You guys are an extreme need. I am an extreme need for comfort given the situation of the world in COVID today, because so many things have changed and our abilities to care for patients have completely transcended into something different than we ever thought. All right, so what is the definition of comfort? Kolkaba herself defines comfort as the immediate experience of being strengthened greatly in one or more context of comfort. So we are gonna go over the context of comfort and we're going to go over the types of comfort, but it's important for you to understand that comfort really is defined as a, an immediate experience of being strengthened in those contexts and through one of those types of comfort. All right, so what are the contexts of comfort? The four contexts of comfort that Kaba defines in her theory are the physical, the psychospiritual, the sociocultural, and the environmental. The physical context really pertains to bodily sensations, okay? Homeostatic mechanisms, immune function. What is the physiologic function going on? What is the physical state? That is the physical context. The psychospiritual context of comfort focuses on pertaining to internal awareness of self. Okay, this would include something like self-esteem, identity, sexuality, meaning of one's life, and then also um, an understanding of one's relationship with a higher being. The next context is the sociocultural context. This pertains to the interpersonal, family, or societal relationships that people engage in also refers to family traditions, rituals, and religious practices. And lastly, the environmental context of comfort. This pertains to the external background of human experience. Okay, what's the temperature in the room? What's the lighting like? How noisy is it? What's the sound or the odor or the colors around you? The furniture, the landscape. You know, I was just talking to you when I started this about being in a room that had a comfortable um, temperature for me. That would be an environmental context. All right, so there are also three types of comfort that Kolkata defines in her theory, okay? The first one is relief, the second one is ease, and the third is transcendence. Relief is the state of having a specific comfort need met. Ease is the state of calm or contentment. While transcendence, actually one of my favorite, I think, believe it is my favorite type of comfort, means the state of rising above a problem or an issue. Okay, so when people have the ability to rise above an issue, whether it be in the physical, psycho-spiritual, environmental, or sociocultural context, that is known as transcendence. Just check our time. So the three types of comfort interventions are really also important for us to discuss. There are technical interventions, coaching interventions, and then comfort food for the soul interventions. Technical interventions are really those that are um, focused on protocol, okay? So like medication administration, treatments, monitoring schedules for patients. The real technical interventions focus on those protocol type of issues. Then you have coaching, and coaching is, consists of really supporting and supportive nursing actions, okay? Active listening, referrals to other care providers or the healthcare team, advocacy and reassurance. And then comfort food for the soul, my favorite type of comfort intervention, are those extra special things that nurses and really essentially people can do for patients that matter most. The little things, okay? So offering a back massage, taking a patient for a walk or a hand massage, kind of going above and beyond um, those technical and coaching types of comfort interventions. 
So Kolkata has developed and um, uses what's called the taxonomic structure. And the taxonomic structure is essential because this is a way for when you're considering really looking at, at a patient or a situation and their comfort needs and enhancing comfort needs, you would use this taxonomic structure to place that situation on this grid. All right, and they sit juxtaposed here adjacent to one another. You have the context here down the left, and then you have the types of comfort here across the top. And Comfort does, or um, Kolkata does an excellent job and a really innovative job at making these match up. So here, relief, a physical relief might be pain relief, okay? Um, a psycho-spiritual relief might be anxiety, right? Uh, a physical transcendence component might be ambulating after surgery, okay? So maybe somebody's experiencing pain and they're hurting a little bit, but they're transcending because they know they need to walk after surgery. So they're going to transcend past that pain and they're going to ambulate after surgery. This structure really helps you if you're going to be using research or if you're going to be making a patient plan, care plans for comfort, et cetera, helps you build what that um, individual experience and situation uh, specific to your patient or situation should be and what it should look like. And this taxonomic grid is really kind of that structure is the, sort of the first step in implementing um, any propositions of Kolkata's theory. So the next part of um, the theory that I wanted to go over was Kolkata's actual conceptual framework for her comfort theory. Okay, so the conceptual model is essential when you consider any theory, because really the conceptual model will state for you in a nice, beautifully arranged picture, how the theory works. So let's go over how this theory works with regard to the conceptual framework that Kolkata has developed. And she has modified this some over the years, but it's working um, conceptual framework as it states currently, it looks a lot like this. So patients with healthcare needs or people with healthcare needs, okay, plus nursing interventions, plus those intervening variables, okay, so those outside variables, okay, leads to enhanced comfort. When patients, people, communities, and um, institutions, et cetera, experienced enhanced comfort, they're more likely to engage in health-seeking behaviors. Okay, so health-seeking behaviors might be things like external behaviors or internal behaviors, things they do to make themselves healthier. Okay, are they making better choices? Are they quitting smoking? Are they eating better? Or it could be something also as um, special as a peaceful death, okay? And all of those engagement of health-seeking behaviors, that better engagement in health-seeking behaviors can also lead to what's known as institutional integrity. And then institutional integrity is defined um, by two other concepts, including best practices and best policies. So at its very um, core, anyone, especially in an institution, say hospitalized patients or patients in a primary care setting or an emergency room setting, whatever the setting, if they are going to experience enhanced comfort, evidence states they're likely in theory to engage in more health-seeking behaviors, which will increase the integrity of any facility or institution. Will also increase the likelihood for best evidence-based practice in the following of best policies. So conceptually, all of these things are connected and help the theory and help the working model that um, Kolkahaba has developed to actually work. Just check our time here. All right. So the next thing I wanted to discuss with you is the propositions of um, Kolkata's holistic comfort theory. This is really important because in order to really utilize Kolkata's holistic comfort theory in practice, in communities, in um, a family setting, in acute care, primary care, hospitals, all those things we were just talking a little bit about, you have to understand the propositions because the propositions will help you apply the theory. Okay, now, the very basic definition of any theory is going to be a set of concepts connected by propositions. So if you're thinking something might or might not be a theory, just ask yourself this, are there concepts and are they connected by the propositions? If so, it's probably a working theory with a good conceptual model, okay? Um, the first proposition of Kolkata's theory is this, 
Comforting interventions, when effective, result in increased comfort of recipients compared with a pre-intervention baseline. So increased comfort is the immediate desired outcome for this kind of care. Basically what this means is if you are implementing something and it's something that will help a patient or a community or um, hospital, et cetera, to experience comfort, increased comfort will be the outcome, okay? So when effective, a result in increased comfort recipi recipients compared with a pre-intervention baseline, increased comfort is the immediate desired outcome, okay? The second proposition, Increased comfort of recipients result in their being strengthened for their tasks ahead, which are known as health-seeking behaviors. Okay, so going back to that conceptual model, that um, conceptual framework that we were looking at on the previous slide, if patients are experiencing more comfort, they're likely going to engage in more healthy-seeking behaviors. That's proposition number two. Proposition number three. Increased engagement in health-seeking behaviors results in increased institutional integrity. So we were talking a little bit about the institutional integrity um, on that conceptual model as well, and the focus on best practices and best policies. If more individuals or one individual or whatever it is the situation you're looking at are engaging in more health-seeking behaviors, you're likely to have a better integrity of the institution. Okay, for example, if more people are ambulating after surgery, that's going to have better outcomes for the overall institution, correct? Because that means that there will be decreased effects of not ambulating after surgery. So maybe less risk of falls, less risk of um, clots, and less risk of um, coming back, being readmitted after surgery. So that Proposition 3 focuses on when people are engaging in their health seeking behaviors better then the institutional integrity will increase. All right, so I also wanted to go over some examples of some innovation, okay, and application of Dr. Kokaba's theory. And this has, over the years, certainly evolved. You know, the focus of this discussion is in evolve and evolution of comfort, again, Comfort does not escape evolution. It will always evolve with nursing and evolution. And that's simply because all of our patients have comfort needs and they always will. But it's important to describe some of the ways that this theory has been applied and then some of the ways that people have used it for innovation. Now, one of the most um, seminal works by Kolkaba is her early work on the effects of guided imagery in breast cancer patients. Okay, so Dr. Kolkata did begin a lot of her work in testing her theory and utilized a research study focused on the effects of guided imagery in breast cancer patients. Some other examples here are the effects of femoral site immobilization on bleeding and comfort with coronary angiogram. Um, another example would be the effects of cognitive strategies on bladder control and comfort. We have um, efficacy of hand massage in hospice patients, also the efficacy of healing touch, and the effects of warming blankets in preoperative patients. Moving on and discussing a little bit more innovation and application. So there, um, the Kolkata's comfort theory has also been used as inspiration to apply to different settings or um, different school systems. A lot of um, nursing institutions have applied Kolkata's theory and looked through her lens of comfort and not necessarily conducted a research study, but applied the theory of holistic comfort to their inner workings, whether it be an institution or the education setting. So one example is the peri-anesthesia nursing setting. Okay, an additional example is a fast track undergraduate nursing education program. I, uh, comfort theory has been also viewed through the lens of pediatric nursing, or I'm sorry, pediatric nursing has been th viewed through the lens of Kolkata's theory. Psychiatric nursing, in addition to cardiac care, 
care of pregnant women, the care of the dialysis patient. And then I myself have had a few publications focused on the exploration of pediatric procedural holistic comfort. I've done a systematic review of pediatric procedural holistic comfort. And then most recently, um, the development of a pediatric procedural holistic comfort new instrument. And that feasibility of that instrument has been ass assessed and innovation has been explored. And then the um, instrument itself is now in the process of getting uh, validity and reliability testing going. So one of the most important things to remember when you are going to apply a mid-range theory of nursing. So Kokaba's holistic comfort theory is a mid-range theory of nursing. So what that means is we can test it and we can apply it in those tests and utilize um, the theory to assess whether or not the tenets in the concepts actually um, showed what we assumed they would, okay? If we're applying comfort uh, interventions, is comfort being enhanced? If not, we need to look at different comfort measures. If we are applying comfort and patients are uh, engaging uh, in health seeking behaviors, is institutional integrity increased? If not, we need to look at maybe uh, changing some of the interventions and helping patients to engage in more health seeking behaviors. So, but one of the ways that we do that is through measurement instruments. So we really can't assess whether or not comfort um, has enhanced or changed or not changed unless we have an actual instrument that has been deemed valid and reliable. So uh, Dr. Kokaba herself, also in partner with many different um, researchers and authors have conducted some research, validity and reliability testing. And there are instruments out there that you can use that Kokaba has published and other authors have published for use of all authors. And then there are some others um, that are not yet reliable and not yet valid, they're still in current testing. And then there's others that maybe need to be adapted. So Dr. Kolkata is very open to all authors, all nurses and other disciplines adapting her general comfort questionnaire. Okay, so that's this one right here. Adapting the general comfort questionnaire and testing that for reliability and validity in other patient populations. So let's just say for example, that you would like to do um, a study focused on patients who are between the age, geriatric patients who are between the age of 65 and 80, and you would like to do an assessment of their comfort while they are um, pre-op and post-op. Well, you may want to adapt the general comfort questionnaire to that age group and in that patient scenario. And you can certainly do that with, you know, um, appropriate reliability and validity testing. So again, there are some of these instruments that are out there for your use and your, your ability to use them is open. And then there are some that you would need to develop yourself in order for it to be really reliable and valid in um, the internal validity of your study. So let's look at a real quick example, check our time here. Um, this is from Dr. Dr. Kolkaba's 2003 um, text that uh, has published and really is a collection of all her work all of the tenets, all of the propositions, and all of the uh, basics on how to understand, implement, apply, and work through Dr. Kolkaba's theory have all been published in this text. And I'll go over that in a few more slides that I'll show you exactly what that textbook looks like. But so if you wanted to really kind of take a situation and apply that, you could do that by working through Dr. Kolkaba's uh, conceptual model. So these are the things found in the conceptual model and you can really just essentially name them for yourself. So this is Dr. Kolkaba's example of the breast cancer patients and radiation therapy study. All right, so in this study, her healthcare needs that she was looking at were comfort needs of women with early breast cancer going through radiation therapy. The nursing intervention that was being assessed and tested was guided imagery, okay, via audio tape. The intervening variables, okay, so the things going on outside extraneously um, that could intervene or affect patient comfort, that's age, marital status, dependent children, education, and anxiety. Those are the things that Dr. Kolkaba pointed out for intervening variables in this study. Now, as far as the element and the concept of enhanced comfort, 
That would be comfort related to women with early breast cancer going through radiation therapy, okay? This really is the definition of what kind of comfort is Dr. Kolkaba assessing in this example. And then health seeking behaviors, which were not actually measured on in this research uh, that was conducted, but you can identify them because it's still essential. Health seeking behaviors here were functional status, immune function, and skin condition. So after you've lined up what your scenario is, it's really easy. You can see here how lining these things up, working through the conceptual model, maybe starting with that taxonomic grid that I went over a little bit earlier, that makes your application of the theory a lot easier to understand. So let's focus now a little bit on how you can apply or utilize comfort theory. That really depends on your specific aims. Are you doing qualitative research or are you doing quantitative research? Okay, as we discussed previously, Dr. Kolkava's theory of holistic comfort is a mid-range theory of nursing. So it's testable, which is excellent for quantitative research and also quality improvement um, investigations. You can certainly still utilize the tenets of Dr. Kolkava's theory as inspiration and a lens for your qualitative research. I have done that. It's certainly possible. But you would also make sure that you're considering what other philosophical underpinnings you would use um, in conjunction with Dr. Kolkava's theory. So things, qualitative research, you might be thinking um, of utilizing Kolkava's lens to view uh, concepts through, but you would also want to make sure that based on the type of research you're doing and the methodological approaches that you are engaging in, that you're utilizing appropriate philosophical um, underpinnings, for example, naturalistic inquiry or um, you know, other forms of theory that exists more with an inductive research. All right, so let's go over some comfort theory application examples. We'll make this um, as simple as possible. These are just examples that I created. They're not anything that's actually even been conducted. They're just some examples that I created because I wanted to give you uh, something to kind of think about, to chew on with application of uh, comfort theory. So we're gonna go over a research example first, and then we're gonna go over a quality improvement. So some of the differences, basic differences between a research investigation and a quality improvement investigation. So research really is defined more by the discovery of science, whereas quality improvement equally as important is the translation of that science. So this would be an example of comfort theory and its uh, discovery, of science, discovery of science, so a research example. So this is uh, the title of the project, Enhancing Comfort Among Pregnant Women in the Third Trimester Via Foot Massage in Primary Care. Okay, so basically we are going to assess the comfort levels of women in third trimester who receive foot massage. Okay, the purpose is to assess comforting effects of foot massage for third trimester pregnant women in a primary care setting. The theoretical lens, okay, so we can certainly use Kolkata's mid-range theory of comfort as a guiding theory for this project. And we would have to say, what proposition does that best fit with? So third trimester pregnant women have many comfort needs in all contexts. So proposition one is probably the best because proposition one really kind of focuses on enhanced comfort with comfort interventions, right? The general comfort questionnaire could be used to assess comfort. And given that there's no specific uh, comfort questionnaire that focuses on third trimester primary um, or third trimester pregnant women, you may actually even do a dual assessment of reliability and validity in this instrument while you are assessing um, comfort in these women. So methods to consider for an example of research like this might be pre and post intervention data collection. Okay, so what was the comfort levels prior to giving foot massages to these women in primary care? What were the comfort levels after giving foot massage in primary care? And then data analysis could be descriptive statistics. So that means it purely describes the data, or you could use inferential statistics, which means this allows you to make predictions from the data. Okay, so one example might be if you're looking at pre and post comfort levels, if you see a difference in those comfort levels, how does certain demographics intersect with that? Okay, that would be more inferential. What um, correlations might you see between women who are 
Caucasian or African American or Asian and their experiences of comfort with foot massage versus just giving um, descriptions of the data, which says these were the comfort levels before and these were the comfort levels after. So the next example I wanted to go over was a, a quality improvement example, because really comfort theory, Kolkata's mid-range comfort theory can be utilized for both of these examples, discovery of science and translation of science. So the example I've provided here for QI is implementation of a pregnancy comfort protocol, a multi-site application of foot massage for women in the third trimester of pregnancy. Okay, so you can already kind of hear just in the title how you're applying quality improvement here, okay? The purpose of the project here would be to assess clinic adherence with and patient satisfaction outcomes of a newly established foot massage comfort policy for third trimester pregnant women in obstetric care. The theoretical lens, we here can, if you really look deeply, can see that increasing engagement of health-seeking behaviors, foot massage and enhanced comfort, may result in increased patient satisfaction and overall institutional integrity and adherence with the protocol. So I think that proposition three would probably be the best fit here. Again, when you're thinking about applying a theory and um, comfort theory in particular, you wanna think about what proposition are you really testing? What are you looking at doing in your work? And then as far as methods, you can certainly do a statistical assessment of clinic adherence with the comfort protocol. We wanted to see part of this um, project is really how well did the um, clinic sites adhere to the protocol? We wanna see the pre and post implementation of data collection um, of patient satisfaction. Did patient satisfaction scores go up with those who adhered more to the protocol of foot massage? If so, wonderful. If not, why? Data analysis could be descriptive statistics only, again, describing the data or inferential statistics, which allows you to make predictions from the data. Most um, quality improvement only requires that of descriptive statistics, but it is not against the rules to do inferential stati um, statistics in quality improvement. All right, so if you are thinking about comfort theory study or using Kolkava's comfort theory in your own work, it's going to be essential that you get this textbook um, or uh, workbook that Kokaba published. And it's called Comfort Theory and Practice. It is an excellent book that really brings together all of Kokaba's work and brings together all of her tenets, her propositions, lots of examples for you. Um, and then of course, all of the seminal articles by Dr. Kokaba in the early 1990s, 1991, 1992. Um, those articles are gonna be essential for you to review as well. And that will help you in building your study or building your quality improvement work or building your application of Kolkata's um, theory in whatever environment that you wish to do that. That is the end of our discussion on the evolution of Dr. Kolkata's theory of comfort. So if you have any questions, you certainly can reach out to me. I've put my email here. It's bicea at uncw.edu. And I am happy to answer any questions that you all have with regard to the implementation of or questions about the um, exploration of Kolkata's theory of holistic comfort. It was so wonderful joining you all this morning and have a wonderfully comforted day.